Welcome to PGA West, and with apologies to those who have been waiting online for the presentation, I'd like to call the meeting to order at this time, and would like to invite Paul Levy to come forward and lead us in the flag salute and the invocation, please. Good morning. We were here for some seven hours. 
hours after the day in, in a board meeting, and Todd, you and your team are just remarkable. Thank you for all your kindness and your gracious hospitality. I'd like to also thank the members of PGA West, all of the members who have allowed us to be at their club today. I would like to introduce some important people in the audience right now, uh, our past presidents, those men who have provided the roadmap for us, uh, a map that we are still following today. And as they stand, we'll hold our applause, please. Mr. Pat Casey, Mr. Pat Riley, Mr. Bill Holbert, Mr. David Foster, Mr. Skip Whitted, and Mr. Tom Adams. Thank you very much. We've got many strong relationships with many allied associations, but chief among them is the SCGA, the amateur body that we work very closely with. And this morning with us, uh, uh, a remarkable ambassador for the game, one of the most knowledgeable individuals on the planet, uh, a very fine gentleman, Mr. Craig Kessler. Craig, thank you for being here this morning. <laughs> and our many fine sponsors who you'll meet in just a little bit. Uh, and this, as we go on, I would like to uh, extend uh, congratulations on behalf of all of us to Mike Miles, Mike Mitchell, Chris Darkjohn, and Ron Skagan, uh, who have just returned from the Senior PGA Championship. Good going, guys. <laughs> and with that, we've got uh, a number of speakers this morning that I know are going to provide education for all of us. And the first one, uh, the 14 districts that our association uh, shares, uh, we are District 11, uh, comprised of the Aloha section, the Northern California section, and of course, we here in Southern California. And we're lucky to have a director from our section serve the association. Uh, today, on his 63rd birthday, and still maintaining one of the finest stocks of hair, and even in the United States, Bill Holbert, if you'd like to come up and say a few words.
that growth occurs, then some of the other, other issues facing us, like key time providers and jobs, all improve. So crucial, crucial time, and again, it's, it's, it's truly an honor for me to be involved with all of this going on at this time. And I want to talk a little bit specifically about Paul Levy. You all know, I think, that you know, he ran twice to become Secretary of the PGA. He has been a member of our section for, I think, eight or nine years now. I was involved in his campaign. And we are so fortunate not just to have Paul as an officer because he's from our section, but because with everything that is going on within the association, right person at the right time could not be more ap applicable than it is with Paul. He is going to be a tremendous officer. He is a tremendous officer. And I will leave it at that, but I can't tell you how fortunate I feel to serve at the same time that he is serving and how proud I am to have him supporting us and working for us on behalf of the PGA member. So with that, I just want to really try to make sure that you understand that one of my goals as your district director is to communicate as much as I can. So I am putting articles in the program. I am putting things in the uh, weekly e-blast, which unfortunately we have a relatively low rate of open on those compared to maybe some other sections. So I would encourage you for a number of reasons that when that weekly e-blast comes out, that you open it and take a look at what's in there. And not just for stuff that I might be providing as district director, but as chairman of the teaching committee, we are also trying to put in a bi-weekly teaching segment for you as an instructor, where you're using members of the teaching committee to put content in there. And it's some good stuff, believe me. So I would also encourage you that you know, if we have a 25% open rate, in other words, only 25% of our members are opening something that is coming to them bi-weekly or weekly from the, their, your own association, I think we need to work on that. I think it's well within your while to just pop that thing open, see if there's anything in there that appeals to you. You might learn something, and you certainly will be kind of abreast of what's going on within this great section. So thank you again. If there's anything I can do for you, as, as your director, please let me know. I will always value your input. So I continually post my phone number and my email address. And if there's anything that you want to comment on or, or ask a question about relative to national issues, please either contact myself or contact Paul. We are here for you. Thanks very much. Bill, thanks. We, we, we are lucky to share a zip code with a national officer um, and certainly having a director. And I would just encourage all of you who have thoughts and opinions to share them because both of these men are very accessible. Uh, Paul will join um, the great Pat Riley, the great Tom Addis, and the great Joe Novak as fourth president to serve the association from the Southern California section. For that, we should be proud. And with that, I'd like to introduce Paul Levy, who's going to say a few words. And I've asked Paul not to speak about anchoring the stroke at this point. I was hoping we could have a robust conversation about that in the open forum. Paul, please. Uh, good morning. First of all, I want to thank Bill for his uh, kind comments. It is a pleasure for me to get to serve with Bill. I was a section officer in Southern Texas about when Bill was in Southern Cal. We got to know each other. Oh, probably did 15, 20 years ago, and he's become a dear friend. And for those of you who are wondering, that is his real hair. So I know probably a lot of you want to go to the website and check that out. Um, you know, let me share first of all, when you get elected to be an officer, you know, all the kind words people speak about you, I want to make it real clear. I'm no different than any of you. I'm a kid who grew up playing golf at a muni golf course, loved the game, played in college, turned professional. Became a teacher, she became a head golfer, director of golf, and I still deal with the same issues you deal with. Even though I'm the president of Club Operations for Sunrise, I'm also the GM at Toscana, and you know, I was I was at a at a meeting and I got a phone call from one of the members, and I was next to Derek Sprague and I said, see Derek, I do the same things. You know, ladies upset because of something happened in the dining room. Someone's upset because of what's going on in the golf course. The course is in good shape, not in good shape. At the end of the day, we're all in this business because we love the game of golf, but the business has gotten very complicated, and the business has become very challenging. And, you know, we as an association need to continue to provide the opportunities and the education to have our professionals be an influence in this industry. And I can tell you, 
that your leadership team, the board of directors, the uh, officers, our new executive team are very committed to doing what we can do to promote the game of golf and promote our professionals. Uh, Brianne, if you would. I gotta kind of sneak out to see where we are. Thank you. you can go to the first slide for me. I'm gonna try to sit through these slides so that I have some time for any questions. And please, if you don't have a question to ask me today or if you wanna ask something in private, uh, my cell phone, 760-417-9048. Give me a call, I'd love to talk to you. Any input you have on anything. First of all, I'm gonna talk about our new leadership team. Everyone by now is aware that we have a new CEO, Pete Babaco. Pete is someone who came to us from uh, being a walk-on football player at Notre Dame, went to law school at uh, Georgetown, and I can tell you, after working with Pete for about seven months, he is very connected in this industry. He is extremely intelligent, a great listener, and I'm amazed at the contacts that he has. He is learning a lot about the association, but he brings a fresh set of eyes and looking at things. You know, we tend to do things. I worked for a golf pro back in the early 80s in Texas, and I'd always say, pro, why do we do that? They'd say, well, son, don't you know rule number seven? What's rule number seven, pro? He says, because we always do it that way. We have asked our senior leadership to take a fresh look at everything we do from a standpoint of staffing, operations, what our focus should be. We've also recently at St. Louis at the PGA Seniors had the staff send us uh, the first draft of a new strategic plan, something that has been needed to come out for quite some time. I remember many a meeting as a young delegate here in Pat Riley talking about the Booz Allen Report and the things that we need to do to bring us forward. Well, here we sit in the year 2013 in the 21st century, and we need to have a plan that's going to get us for the next 10 or 20 years for where we need to be. Additionally, besides Pete, Darrell Crawl, Darrell is someone I've known for 20 years. In 1994, I think he came to Northern Texas and became the executive director. We are very lucky to have Darrell. For those who don't know, Darrell, of course, was in the interview process for the CEO job, and they saw such such strengths in Daryl, this was before I got elected, decided to offer him the chief operating officer position. And I think what is a great asset for Daryl, being an executive director, he understands what the sections deal with, and he's an advocate for what the sections struggle with on a daily basis. How do we get more programs delivered at a section level is important because that's where you live. How do you get more programs delivered at a local level? How can we get more funding to the sections? So Daryl's a great asset to us. And last, in my first meeting with the officers, it was decided to promote Carrie Hay. And for those of you, I know I saw Chris and Mike at St. Louis last week. For those of you who have not, never had the pleasure to play in one of our national championships or go to the PGA Championship or Ryder Cup and see Kerry in action, he is truly the best at what he does in the world. I truly believe that. And we saw that value in Kerry. We all agree we need to elevate Kerry to a position that was appropriate for someone with his skills. And also, let's not forget that Kerry really is the rainmaker for the PGA. Because of the financial windfalls we get from the PGA Championship and the Ryder Cup are critical. Another thing that we really focused on is we tried to have some continuity and governance. Ted, Derek, myself were three individuals. But one of the challenges is always the change of pace, the change of uh, how the officers might see things need to be, what their agenda is, what their personal hot buttons are. We work every meeting, every time we talk, and probably I'd say Ted and Derek and I speak at least once a week, just like now we have a monthly board call that Bill Holbert's part of as a process so that the board of directors is plugged in every month with the officers. We are continually working on making sure that we're not confusing the staff and that we're setting one course of direction and that we all buy into what we have agreed to do. So that when Ted goes out as president in 18 months and Gary comes in, there won't be this dynamic change like maybe at your local country club when the new president comes on board. The Ryder Cup captain, I think by now everyone knows Tom Watson. I think it's a great choice. And let me share this about the Ryder Cup. They're probably going to get sick of hearing from me, but I have shared that between the Ryder Cup and the PGA Championship, let's see what we can do to bring some of these events again to the West Coast. 
I'm a guy who grew up in New Orleans, but I spent all my professional career in Texas, west of the Mississippi, and we know there are very few of our PGA Championships and Ryder Cups that have been had west of Mississippi. The value of a Ryder Cup or PGA Championship on the west coast to the networks where prime time in New York City, you're watching the final round of the PGA Championship, can be very lucrative. So that's something we're discussing, future Ryder Cup sites, future PGA Championship sites. And I tell you, I will definitely champion how do we get something, how do we bring more of these events to the West Coast? You can always stay east of Mississippi with everything we do in the PGA. For those of us who have lived in the West, we know that we have to be a voice, we have to stand up and be an advocate for bringing things out here. Anchoring, I'm not going to go into much detail. We're going to discuss it later, but I think by now everyone knows that the officers, we've tried to defend the opinions of our professionals. When we polled the professionals to get everyone's opinion on where we stand with anchoring back in November, we have tried to champion that position to the industry and make sure that we've had a voice in the golf industry on how the PGA of America feels, what we think is important on this subject. It's a very emotional subject. It's been a very time-consuming subject. My first six or seven months in office, I'd say, between anchoring and our properties, which I'm going to touch base on, I've spent 80, 85 percent of my time. Ted Bishop, your president, has done one heck of a job of representing you on a national basis. I think many of you have seen Ted on the Golf Channel, have read the articles in the magazines, and we have tried to make sure that the industry, the RNA, and the USGA have heard our position. Since the decision came out, there's been a letter sent to all of you, the PGA members. The letter was sent to the USGA. The PGA Tour has had constant communication with us. Ted has built a great relationship with Tim Fincham on this subject. And there's a lot more to come. At this point in time, our position is just kind of sit tight. We've played our cards. We've stated our case. The decision's come out. And probably right now, we're just going to kind of sit tight and see what the PGA Tour does, see what the players do. Because the question we get asked everywhere we go is, so what's the PGA of America going to do next? Well, right now we're kind of in a holding pattern to see what the Tour does, see what the players do. 2016 is a long time away, and I think we're going to have a lot more discussions on anchoring, and we're going to talk on it later. Additionally, we have a board of directors meeting in June at Sun River, and we're going to discuss from our board of directors standpoint, how do they feel? What do they think should be our next step? <clears throat> and we've asked the board to ask their sections. Because the important thing to remember is this board of directors, as Bill Holbert does, he's there to poll the three sections he represents. And we ask that each board of director do that so we have a national consensus of how the sections feel, our professionals, what their temper, what, <clears throat> what their temperature is on this subject. Where do they think we should go next? At the end of the day, it's a subject that, I guess my personal view is, nobody's going to be a winner. It's caused a lot of heartburn. It's caused some divisiveness. It's not going to make a huge difference in many of your lives and livelihoods as far as uh, feeding your families. It could cause you some trouble at your club. If you're at a club where, let's say, one of the USGA executives is at your club and you decide to end to implement a local rule, even though the USGA says you can. So, you know, we're, we know there's going to be a lot of issues with anchoring. Next slide, please. PGA Golf Properties. Again, living in the West, I'm just curious, how many of you in this room have ever been to Port St. Lucie Golf Club? More than I thought. We've not done a good job. I think I shared when I spoke to this group after I was elected the first 30 days. We'll admit to you, we've not done a good job. We, the PGA of America, running our properties. We've been challenged financially. The condition of the golf courses were just not good. In fact, they were probably worse than that a couple of them. The, uh, our ability to deliver the customer service we need to deliver, just as you do at your clubs every day, hasn't been there. And since I visited with everyone last, there's been some changes. We've uh, made changes at the senior level. We've brought in a new golf course superintendent, Dick Gray. Dick is a veteran of the industry, 35, 40 year veteran. Uh, in fact, as we speak, Dick Gray right now is overseeing redoing the greens at 
the old Port St. Lucie Country Club. And uh, the greens on that golf course were probably more than 30 years old, and there was just nothing left. And they transitioned out of, out of the uh, winter season back to Bermuda. There's just not much there. So that's a commitment that we've made to get the facility back in shape. The other golf courses, I, I know any of you were there in the fall or in the last year. I think you would today see a difference in the condition. It's, uh, we're just starting this process. Dick's got a huge job overseeing the four golf courses. Gary Shaw, he was retained on an interim basis for the last 90 days to help us manage the property as we made changes in the staff. And starting on June 1st, we have a new general manager. There were five of us that were involved in the hiring process of finding the best person suited to lead PGA properties, to run it as a business, to run it as you run your club, to get it in shape, and for it to be a source of pride for all PGA members. So Jimmy Terry today, I guess he'd be on his third day on the job. I happen to know Jimmy for many years, and I know he'll do a great job. He came to us from the TPC network and has several years experience in their network and was one of their best operators. So if any of y'all get to Port St. Lucie in the coming months or in the next 12 months, please drop me a line and let me know what you think about the condition. And more importantly, we have a fiscal responsibility to this association, our members, to improve the bottom line of that facility. So I can tell you we've already made strides in some of the changes that have been made, and that's something I ask you to keep your eye on, of course. Next slide. Valhalla Golf Club has been renovated. Two, 2014 PGA Championship will be at Valhalla. Uh, you'll be glad to know we have actually hired a new general manager there by promoting Keith Reese, longtime PGA Director of Golf to General Manager. And uh, the golf course is receiving rave reviews. Chris Hamburg, a local uh, PGA professional, has been named the head golf professional in April. And actually Valhalla, for those of you who might have an interest, doesn't lose money, it makes money. Operation runs very well. Great golf course, great shape. We have spent a lot of money, I think, uh, redoing the greens just recently and changes for the golf course. But remember, when we go to Valhalla to play a championship, there's a definite economic benefit to playing at our club versus some of the others. But it still must stand the test of being a great test of golf. Revenues and staffing, I'm not gonna read these numbers, but the bottom line is, we for many years have been spending more than we take in kind of like the American family. Um, and that's something that in our strategic plan that we know we need to address. A six or eight percent gap between our patterns of revenue and expense is just not acceptable. But we as an association have so much money that maybe sometimes it doesn't quite hit the radar. This executive team of Pete, Daryl, and Carrie, and Ted, and Derek, and myself, it's something that we know that you cannot do that forever. Jason Levy, Canterbury Investments, who oversees our, of course, endowed investment fund, that just doesn't work, spending more than take in. It will, it will catch up with you. And so one of the things that Pete has been focused on, and the thing that I've been most impressed with with Pete so far, is very revenue driven. You know, we have all been at our clubs where the management company, the club, the ownership says cut, 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 cut. And you get to the point where you've cut down to nothing. And they still want you to improve the bottom line. The best way to improve the bottom line is enhance revenue, grow revenue. Because sometimes when you cut expense to the point that you cut it to the bone, you don't have the ability to produce the revenue for your facility. And I think that's the thing that's impressed me the most with Pete is his focus on how do we enhance and drive new revenue sources. We've hired several new staff Senior Directors, Scott Kimmick of the New Jersey PGA, heading up the PGA Foundation, of which I think there's great potential for us to really grow the foundation. It's probably an area of the PGA that we haven't focused on in the last so many years to take the best advantage of. Additionally, we brought in Kevin Rand, the first true chief of marketing that the PGA of America has had. Kevin was an executive with IMG. In fact, it's kind of interesting. He did deals where he was on the other side of the fence with the PGA of America, and that was working for us. Additionally, Mike Burke, Director of Merchandising, our first true Director of Merchandising. To enhance what we do at the PGA Championship, the Ryder Cup, to find a better way to use economy of scale, 
not just enhance what we do as far as whether we sell X million of dollars in the merchandise tent for the week. And those of you who have been to a PGA Championship or Ryder Cup know that is a huge enterprise, the merchandise of these events. But to really look at a comprehensive plan of what we do with merchandise. You know, one of the things that we've charged Mike to do in this first year, take a look at how can we sell logo merchandise to our members for a cost plus type basis as opposed to maybe going online and paying a keystone for a golf shirt. You know, let's find a way to get our logo merchandise, whether it be clothing, uh, iPad covers, briefcases, lapel pins, money clips. So that's something we're going to take a look at is how do we, and that's not about revenue. That's about giving benefits to our members and allowing you to have a, a better way, more economical way to show off the badge that you're so proud of wearing. Licensing partners. Um, Pepsi, of course, has kind of made some changes to the program that they're involved in with us. How many of you here are on the Pepsi program? Do you know? Not many. Additionally, you know, we're looking at several other licensing opportunities. One of the things that we have asked all of our people in the business development to do is every time that they look at creating a new deal for the PG of America, let's make sure there's a way that it touches the individual member. And that's a hard thing to do. Many of us have sat back for many years and said, gee, the Delta Airline deal, I'm never going to use that. The fee that we pay for Delta Airlines is way too high. One of the things that's hard to do is to find ways sometimes in creating these deals that it's going to benefit the association and benefit the member. And that's something that we've challenged this development with. Key expenditures, 5.7 million dedicated to Golf 2.0. And as Jeff said, the numbers are, are getting worse. We just got the recent numbers that say we've lost 770,000 more golfers. Those coming in, those going out, negative attrition. Get Golf Race is a great program. I encourage every one of you to be involved in whichever way you can to grow around to your facility, whether it's public, private, whether you're at a retail store, whether you're at a driving range. Nothing else matters if we do not grow grounds, if we do not create more golfers. And I can tell you, it's, uh, with all the things we're doing, with all the promotion we're doing, we have a long ways to go. Last year, we got kind of a false sense of security that things were doing better because rounds were up. Rounds were up, but new golfers weren't up. New golfers were down. Rounds were up last year because the weather was awesome all over the country. This year, weather has not been as good, and we're seeing that trend in the numbers. Economic impact study, I'll just leave that slide up for a second. I'm not going to read it. Obviously, the golf industry is a huge undertaking in our nation's economy. PGA.com update. Basically, PGA.com is our joint venture partnership with the Turner People, Turner Broadcasting. And we do a lot of great things with PGA.com. One of the things that we've discussed, though, is we need to improve our digital presence in every which way we, we can. The world lives today on your iPhone, on your Android, on whatever the phone, whatever your little pocket computer is, that's where the world is. That's where we go to probably 70% of our web surfing is done on our telephone. PGA Links, on the other hand, the member's website, one thing that I think you'll see in the next year or two is some changes in that area. Right now, Pete and Daryl are focused on how do we set up within the senior staff, who should be responsible. For example, PGA Links, a lot of the different department heads are responsible for updating that part of the website. We need to have kind of one department that's going to oversee and be involved in managing that process, and we need to do a better job of making PGA Links a better resource for you, the member. And on the PGA.com side, we need to do everything we can to make that be a consumer-driven website where the consumers want to go to pga.com. You can just throw the last couple of slides up, Brian. In closing, your association deals with a lot of complex issues. 
And I can tell you, every day, your leaders are working on your behalf. I've sat out in that audience for many years when I was a young apprentice 30 years ago. And, you know, the old saying, what is the PGA doing for me? I encourage everyone in this room to give me your input, give me your ideas. <coughs> Being an officer for the first six or seven months, you really see how many different things that we are involved with our association. All the programs, the initiatives that our staff deal with, tournaments, the membership issues. It's very complex, but things only get better by your input. They only get better by you speaking up. That's why I'm standing up here. About 20-something years ago, I stood up at a meeting and had our section president at the time challenged me, and 20 years later, I stand before you today. We're not perfect. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to sit back and say, gosh, why don't we do this or why don't we do that? But collectively, together, it can get a lot better. Uh, at this time, does there anyone have any questions on any subject? I appreciate it, and I know we'll have some fun talking about anything later. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks very much, Paul. Um, I'm going to give you just a quick recap of your financial position. And I'm going to tell you that your balance sheet remains quite strong uh, with assets of near $12 million and literally no debt. Uh, a cumulative return over the last three years since we've been invested of 35%. Uh, and I'm happy to make that report because we are a very healthy section. And, and more importantly, we're not just trying to collect money, we're trying to spend it on your behalf, whether it's free meetings from now on, that we've enjoyed these last couple of years, or whether it's complimentary education, or our neighborhood golf program and growth of the game initiatives. We're doing many, many things on your behalf that will hopefully uh, reflect well on you. And happy this morning to have with us uh, uh, from Canterbury Consulting, Jason Levy. Uh, Canterbury has been with us for three years, helping guide our portfolio. And Jason's going to give us a review and take any questions you might have about the sections Thanks, Jason. Good morning. Uh, happy to report, as Jeff said, that uh, the portfolio is doing uh, very well for the uh, for uh, PGA. And uh, I thought we could talk a little bit about the portfolio specifically, and then also just a little bit about the market, our outlook, what we're thinking uh, about the markets. Uh, there's, there's a slide up, I think, the first slide. Talk a little bit about where, where we've been and, and where we think we're headed, uh, and then we can talk specifically about the portfolio today, at least through April. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, we've, we've averaged about an eight and a half percent return since uh, 2009, and we can we can credit the PGA with, uh, with the rebound because that's right around the time that the market turned around. But uh, I think what we're spending a lot of time right now at Canterbury talking about and challenging one another about and what everybody's probably thinking about is what this top graph uh, shows here. And, and really since the financial crisis, the market has been on, on a really rapid rise north. And, and, and it's been a, a pretty remarkable recovery in, in the market. And if you if you look here on this top graph, the market's up about 140% since we all remember those very stressful times back in 2008 and 2009 with the financial crisis. And so I, I think the natural question, and, and what we talked a lot about on the all last week was, is, is this sustainable? Is the market getting expensive? And I think that's a very uh, natural uh, question to start asking. And so as we start to think about strategy internally, it's something that we are always trying to uh, think about is, is where are we in a cycle? Where are we uh, in a valuation standpoint for the market? And we certainly don't believe anybody can predict the future, uh, but we do think that you can, you can take a temperature of the market and evaluation of the market and build an outlook that way. So uh, to that point, I'll just talk a moment about uh, the bottom graph, which looks like a, a really messy scatter plot. But what that graph is trying to point out is if you look at valuations of the stock market, the S&P 500, uh, you, can, you can over time get an idea of how expensive or, or cheap uh, the stock market is based on uh, valuation. And what we've looked at over the last four years of the recovery, 
it's not just been a broad rally of the market for no good reason. The corporate America has actually rebounded along with it. Earnings have come back, GDP growth has come back, so there has been a, a broad recovery in, in various metrics that you want to see. And the point I'm trying to get to is if you, if you look at the line uh, on the left, that is where we are in the valuation standpoint. And that suggests that we are somewhat fairly valued in, in the market right now. And when you add that to the fact that we have a, a recovering housing market, manufacturing numbers are coming back, uh, we still have low energy costs, and you add up a number of factors that we're tracking, uh, we, are, we are cautiously optimistic is the term that we're using internally, that the stock market is fairly valued, we feel fairly good about the recovery, and, and that's not to say that there won't inevitably be some, some struggles or some volatility, but uh, we are not at any point thinking that, that this market is, is overvalued or expensive. Right? So just to give a little perspective, because there has been a very large move north in the stock market, but we do believe that staying diversified, staying with a plan that we built for clients like the PGA uh, has, has worked, obviously, and, and we do believe that is the best case going forward. So having said all that, I'll jump one more page uh, to, to where we stood at the end of April, and we can see that uh, there's obviously been very, very strong uh, parts of the portfolio as the market is through May, which is up something like 15.5%. Uh, and, and you can see various, this is through April, but through May, the market was up even more. And so the portfolio through April was up 6.5%, uh, inching closer to 7, uh, as we have a 60-40 a balanced portfolio here for the PGA and led by the domestic equity parts of the portfolio, which were up the most, and then the bond part uh, of the portfolio not up as much as bond markets are somewhat flat, given given the fact that interest rates have started to move higher. But uh, the market is, has been extremely resilient to uh, any sort of negative news, and it's been rallying on positive earnings news, and uh, continues to, to have a positive outlook for, for the recovery that's been going on now for about four years. So. I'll pause there and see if I can answer any questions from the group. Bi-weekly. 
We send out a Tournament Tribune monthly, as well as a new edition, the Foundation Newsletter. I highly recommend you read all of them. Um, our, our current e-news um, has gone bi-weekly, and it has helped our um, open rate actually increase. And But as Bill said, we can always do better. So please uh, read those. It does keep you up to date on uh, what's going on in your section. I know we've done a lot of in addition, we also just relaunched our website. I hope you all have the opportunity to view our website and visit it and browse around. Um, we now have, I would say, uh, it's definitely much more user friendly um, in the navigation than it was before. Make sure you check out the member only area. That area is blocked by PGA links, so only you can get in with your passwords. Um, and the master calendar includes all of our tournaments and um, if you did have our website bookmarked, make sure you do go through and change that to just scpga.com. It used to have dash news in the um, on our homepage before, so make sure you go ahead and um, switch your bookmarks as well. Um, and lastly, I want to speak just a, a moment on social media. Um, if you don't already, I encourage you to follow us on Facebook. Um, and on Twitter, and as well subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, I think we currently have almost 70 videos over the past year from events, um, with slideshows from tournaments. So I definitely recommend you check those out. We're starting to do a few new segments with Jeff, um, just with short interviews, one to two minutes, that you'll start seeing in uh, the e-news as well. So definitely check those out. Um, to get to our social media, if you're on our homepage, it's on the top right-hand corner takes you to any of those locations that you're looking for. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, my door is always open. So thank you so much. Thanks, Brianne. Behind the scenes, uh, conducting many of the events, uh, I'd like you to meet Amy Stollerman. Amy? that I've not met. My name is Amy Stottleman, and I work in programs and events at the section office. I've been on board for about a year and a half now. And what I want to share with you guys today is just a little bit about um, what our foundation is doing and some of the new fundraising programs that we're launching this summer. A lot of you were able to pick up packets I know this morning, so uh, if you haven't picked them up, I still have them available for you. And uh, it's a lot of useful information, just a synopsis of kind of what's going to go on in this program. Uh, the SCPGA Foundation raises money every year uh, to support the grants and scholarships that we provide our juniors in our junior program, and also to support other programs in Southern California that share our goal of promoting the game of golf to youth. So it's really important to us to not only inform our members on what we're doing as a foundation, but also give you an opportunity to be a part of the foundation and get involved. So uh, hopefully through these programs we can do just that. The first program is the three hour challenge, which we will host all throughout August. And it's open to PGA members, apprentices, non-members, alumni, junior, really everyone is more than welcome to participate and we encourage you to do so. Um, Basically how it works is teams will register to host a three hour challenge and those teams will be responsible for collecting pledges per hole to go towards the total number of holes that they will play in a three hour time frame on their challenge day. So all of the proceeds from this event uh, not only benefit our foundation but also benefit the charity that the team selects for half of those proceeds to go to. So it's a 50-50 split uh, and really a win-win for everyone. Another program that we've worked hard on and has been in talks for quite a while is the Junior Tour Alumni Association. It's open to not only alumni, we encourage anyone who wants to be a supporter of the foundation and wants to support our Junior Tour program to join. 
And it's a great way for us to reconnect our past uh, junior tour members with the current program and the current participants. And most importantly, give them that avenue to donate and to be a part of it. We're also excited to host alumni events and social events, fun golf outings, and hopefully uh, bring a lot of you on board to network with one another. So most definitely reach out to any of the foundation staff, really anyone at the section, if you have questions about the foundation or any of the programs we're running out of them. We work really hard to uh, develop these and to keep you all in mind uh, because the member is who we do want uh, to help us reach our goals every year. So I hopefully look forward to getting to work with a number of you. And thanks for your time. I believe I'm turning over to Jeff again. Thank you, Amy. I'd like you to meet uh, Alexandra Teagles. She leads our player development um, staff and works very closely with Nikki Gash and with our board member, Susan Roll. Alex? Good morning, everyone. For those of you who haven't met, my name is Alex Teagles. I work at our player development program. I have the pleasure of working with an outstanding team of individuals, including myself. Uh, we have player development coordinator, Matt Gilson, and two interns. They're wonderful, wonderful folks. I hope you all have a chance to meet them as well. If you've ever been out to an event, I'm sure you will see the party um, ball inflatable hitting cage that we use. Um, our neighborhood golf program, our primary goal is to introduce the game to individuals who may have never tried it out before, maybe they have gotten away from it, and want to get back into it right along with, with the principles of golf 2.0. Um, you know, we go to community events, everything from the Humana Challenge, or just right out in the driving range, to a soccer tournament, a 5K run, anything. Anything that we can come up with, go to Women's Expos. Um, one of our newest pushes has been to go capture the adult audience, and we've been doing that through health expos and corporations. It's been really wonderful. And our goal this year is to reach over 2 million people at these events. Um, we're on, on goal, on track to do that so far. Um, We've attended just over 30 events already this year. Um, we're on track to attend over 60. And we anticipate teaching about 30,000 of these short golf lessons this year. Um, one of the most important parts of this process is involving our VGA professionals, having them out, helping us teach the lessons, getting them involved. Um, what we're trying to do is drive them back to the facilities, trying to get them to take a lesson, and trying to get them to the driving range, to play around golf, whatever it is. We're just trying to get them to your facilities. And we appreciate your help um, coming out to teach at the events. You get MSR credits. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's very, very fun and enjoyable experience for everyone. Um, we have also developed a free lesson a month program, which drives people once again to facilities. Thank you to everyone who participates in that. Um, we give away a free lesson with PGA Professional every month. Um, you're signed up for that. So it's a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, some of the people who participate in that really seen a boost in their business. Um, we will be launching a neighborhood golf for our facilities and the facilities program for the next month. Um, it's going to be a program that offers free rainfalls, um, free animals after 5 p.m., um, free short lessons for first-time visitors. So it'll be a wonderful program. Um, if you need more information if you're interested, please let me know. And once again, we just want to try to involve as many people as possible in trying to get people to your golf courses to start golfing or to play more golf, whatever that is. If you have any questions, concerns, any ideas for events that would be wonderful for us to attend, please let me know or any of the other section staff.
And when uh, the board talked about, you know, we hear 2.0, we hear growth of the game, we hear player development, and, and to us, uh, the board and the staff, that meant going out and touching golfers one person at a time. I think when we all learned golf, we went, I was, uh, you know, I just said to my parents, hey, I want to play. My parents weren't even playing golf anymore, and um, they took me to a, a person who just helped me and taught me the game and showed me how to do things, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So as part of this program is casting this large net over Southern California, but really going out in neighborhoods to where the moms are and the kids are and the dads and the, and the families are and talking to them in a, a very non-intimidating way. And uh, it's really working. Our junior programs are now just soaring through the roof with participants from these being out and talking to people about our programs. And it's really working. And uh, I commend the staff for just staying on task and, and getting it done. And they really are really working <laughs> for us out there. But we really need the, uh, the professionals to help uh, us with these events. So please call uh, myself or Alex and uh, come out and support those events. It's a great opportunity to touch people with golf. Um, but the big reason I'm up here is I'd like to announce uh, a very cool new program that we're hoping to launch here very soon. And that's going to be golf in schools. Uh, PGA, Southern Cal PGA and uh, TGA have uh, formed a partnership to uh, go out in certain uh, select uh, neighborhoods now go to the schools and begin implementing uh, golf in schools, after school programs. And again, all these things that we'll be doing in the schools will be to drive them back to you and all the great programs that the Southern Cal PGA has to offer. Uh, but we know we, we were missing that level uh, in our education and our, in our growth of the game program. And we're very excited to announce that uh, we're moving forward with that program uh, hopefully at the end of this year. So if you have any questions or would like to be involved in that program, please uh, let us know as well. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And we're really uh, quite lucky to have a staff that truly is single-minded in their commitment to our care and betterment. And for that, uh, uh, as we go on these next few meetings, we're going to get to meet all of the staff and understand what they do on our behalf. But thank you very much. And, um, speaking of staff, I'd like to introduce a recovering staff member, uh, Nikki Gatch, who's going to talk a little bit about growing the game the Good morning, everyone. So my name is Nikki Gatch, and I'm a recovering section staff member. Please <laughs> here. First of all, I'd just like to, uh, President Johnson, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address my fellow members. I appreciate that opportunity. And I'd just like to take this time to thank all of you for all that you do day in and day out at your clubs, for our industry, and for our game. You truly are the experts in this game and this, in this business. So I just want to thank you for all that you do. With this new position, it's been so cool for me to be able to work more one on one with our professionals, which I didn't quite have that same opportunity when I was with the section. And that's been the most rewarding for me is to sit down with a professional and, and each, each facility is different. You know, it has its different challenges, different um, opportunities. And it's been nice to sit down and make a plan with a professional and really see that come to life and be successful and get those phone calls and those emails and those texts that, you know, hey, I had 18 ladies in my in my women's program sign up. I've never, you know, hit that number before. We've sold out our big golf ready classes. Hey, I converted a member, a social member, to a full golf member because of some of the player development programs I've done. These things are happening in our section. They're happening across the country as well. So you should be proud of that fact. And to, to kind of piggyback on what Mr. Levy said, professionals that are doing this and seeing the success, they're really becoming the revenue generators of their club. And growing the game certainly is important to our game and to our industry to get more people playing, but it's also important to you to showcase your value to your own owners and management companies and your members. As PJ professionals, you have such a great opportunity ahead of you. I know we talk about some of the, the negativity and, and we're still losing golfers, um, but really I see that as, as a great opportunity for us and especially for our new uh, younger professionals to really make a difference and set themselves apart and showcase your value as a PGA professional, and that's what this is about. 
I certainly don't have all the answers. I wish I did. I wish I had a magic wand uh, to kind of switch things around. But what I, what I do have and what I can share with you are some of the best practices that are happening not only here in your section, but across the country. As I talk with my eight other fellow uh, player development managers across the country on a weekly basis and hear these same stories and these success stories that are happening across the country, I'm able to sit down and share those with you. May or may not work at your facility, but at least we can start talking about it. And, and the key is to not be afraid to be creative at your, at your club. I'm going, to, I'm going to point out Mr. Casey, Patrick Casey, who does a great program at their club where they camp out on the driving range. They do this the, the night before Father's Day, and it's, it's really become, I think you're in your third or fourth year now, it's really become a, a, a fun, successful family event at the club that everyone looks forward to doing. You know, so imagine that being able to, to camp out in the middle of Los Angeles, you know, with your child you know, the night before Father's Day. Pretty cool. So there's clubs that are doing great things like that, and I'm going to try to do my best with, with Brianne's help in, in communicating that to you so that we can share some of those best practices, and, and maybe you can try those at your facility as well. Get Golf Ready has been, uh, has been talked about a little bit this morning. I, I do want to talk about that. It's a, it's a wonderful program. I hope that all of you have started to see the big marketing push that's occurring with Get Golf Ready. During the tour telecast, we also have a presence now on sportsillustrated.com, menshealthmagazine.com, women's health magazine, living social. The marketing push is there. We are driving consumers to get golf ready. The challenge that we have is not enough of our facilities are posting the great programs that you're doing. So that's been my focus the last few weeks is to really work with you one-on-one -on -one to get your programs posted so that you can reap the benefits of this marketing push that we're seeing on a nationwide level. We have a, a partnership with Active.com that would serve as an online registration tool. It's also a great benefit for marketing, email communication. There's a, there's a lot more that it can do um, other than just online registration, but it's, it's been a great partnership. I've been working very closely with some of our facilities to transition them, to start having them post their programs on Active.com. And once you do that, the great thing is that not only do you appear on, on your own website, but you appear on Play Golf America, Get Golf Ready, of course, Active.com, PGA.com, and now YahooSports.com. So you've got five other avenues that your program here locally is, is being publicized and marketed for you at no charge to you for that marketing. So please, please take advantage of that. If you need any help, I've even posted Posted programs for facilities. I have no problem doing that. We'll get you started. We'll get you walk you through a demo of how to use the system properly and to the best uh, for your benefit. So, so please, you know, reach out to me. That's what I'm here for is to, is to help you. A couple of great, uh, great programs that we have: uh, PGA Junior League Golf. I know some of you in the room are fielding teams this year. We're going to have 25 teams in our section. Would love to see that continue to grow. That is about a 60% increase from last year. So that's encouraging, but we'd really like to see um, that, that number continue to increase year in and year out. With, with nearly 500 facilities, I'd like to see us have a little bit more than, than 25 facilities field a team, but it's a great concept that takes the, the little league approach to golf, which I think sometimes we miss with our game. You know, young, young kids are used to playing soccer and basketball and baseball, and they have that team atmosphere, and they really enjoy that. And so it's been a great success. Um, I highly encourage you to, to take a look at that. And uh, I know we've got some, uh, like I said, we've got some teams uh, that you know are here in the room. I know you've just started some of your practices and, and getting ready to start your matches. So we'll also do uh, try to do a nice job of promoting that uh, as to how you do this season. And then the drive, chip, and putt competition. I hope that you saw that that big push uh, during Masters Week. PGA of America has partnered with the USGA and Augusta National to put on this, this wonderful program. We were piloting it in, in uh, 11 areas across the country. And uh, Southern California is one of those areas, so we will be conducting uh, 10 local qualifiers for that and then a regional uh, championship. It's from the region, uh, the regional championship, a boy and a girl from each age division uh, will win the chance to go to Augusta National in 2014 uh, and compete in the finals there at Augusta. So wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, we have a record number of, of children uh, register. I know we have some, some kids coming from out of state, even from out of the country. Uh, I know one of our facilities that I saw, we had a, a child from Columbia coming in to, to qualify here in Southern California. 
So that's gonna, that's gonna continue to be a wonderful program that's gonna be rolled out more nationwide. Um, again, this is kind of the, the, the pilot year, so only 11, uh, 11 sites in the country, so we're very fortunate that, that Southern California is one of those. So I know uh, we've, got, uh, we've got our first qualifier, I believe, this week at Empire Lakes, and I know uh, several of you in this room um, are hosting qualifiers, so I thank you for that, and we look forward to a fun time with that. I'll just say, uh, in closing, you know, we all have to take an active role in growing this game. You know that. We have to set an example. You have to set an example at your club, with your families, with your chapter and section events. I know, you know, what, 100, 140 plus of us are going to be doing that and setting a nice example today. So I look forward to that. I hope I don't have to fall over from heat exhaustion. But we all need to do our part, and we need to encourage our members at your club to play and to do their part as well. Our golfers, current golfers are going to play an important part in growing the game. You know, we have to set a good example. And, and pass it on to your members. You know, if they see a beginner at the, at the club or on the course, tell them to embrace that person. You know, we were all there at one point. Even all of us in this room were beginners at one point. So our current golfers and us as professionals, we have to embrace that. We have to embrace beginners coming into the game. We have to embrace children coming into the game. Um, and, and everyone. And so if we all do our part, we'll, we'll certainly um, improve the state of our industry. So in closing, thank you all for what you do. Um, know that I'm here for you to be a, another resource to the PGA, and I look forward to, to meeting with all of you and, and uh, helping you grow this game. Thanks so much. Nikki Gatch is a gift that just keeps on giving, and Nikki Gatch was elected to membership this spring. Congratulations, Nikki. I'd like to reintroduce your secretary, John McNair.
3.8% tax on net investment income. And of course, this could trigger when you sell your home. And last but not least, if you issue 250 W-2s, the employer needs to put the value of the employer-sponsored benefits on there. And the great thing is, for right now, if you ask the feds why do you need that, they say, well, we're just gathering data. But of course, there's an expectation that it's not a taxable benefit today, but it may be in the future, and we'll see how much money is in the honeypot there. I want to take a, a step back and just kind of talk about a global or a national perspective, the Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid is the federal program for health insurance for very low income, those making below the federal poverty level. In 2014, the deal with the feds are they're going to increase eligibility for Medicaid, and in California, we call that Medi-Cal. That's the California version of it. From 100 to 138% a federal poverty level. Now, the feds, though, will pick up the cost for the first three years, and then their contributions are going to slide down to they're picking up 90% in 2020. Uh, of course, the unions are having a field day with this because from the employer perspective, it kind of makes sense that if the eligibility for Medi-Cal has gone up to nearly $15,000 a year, if you suppress wages and you kick your employees under that, you've kind of alleviated yourself of the burden of offering benefits. And so the unions are making a real stink about that, uh, hoping to pass legislation to find employers. And Governor Brown is already reaching back to the counties, saying the money we give you at the state level, kick down to the county to cover the health care costs of your residents because they will now be eligible for Medi-Cal, we're going to be taking about $300 million of that back. Now, if you look at the map here, the blue states are the states that have set, accepted that deal with the feds. They're going to increase the eligibility to 138%. And the orange states have backed off, not willing to opt in. I, I think a, a big concern is that it's going to be extremely expensive to fund just the Medicaid expansion itself. Now, again, in California, each state also has the ability to offer their own exchange, which offers insurance to individuals. And again, this is going to be live January 1. Or you can pass and start up your own exchange and opt into the federal product. Of course, the green states are going to have their own exchange. The red states are going to let the feds do it. But there's a concern that the too big to fail is going to reemerge its ugly head because what happens when any one of the states in green, when their state insurance change is not solvent? Who's going to backstop that? And are they going to roll into the federal exchange in California? Is there going to be more taxes? The exchanges are only funded for the first year, and they're supposed to be profitable after year one. Well, any of you who buy insurance know that you're reluctant to guinea pig yourself that first year. And the first people that are going to jump into the exchange are probably going to be absolutely terrible risk, and it's going to be really high utilization that first year. Now, in California, our own exchange is going to be called Covered California. And this will be live January 1. About 80% of all doctors and 80% of all hospitals are going to be in the network. Now, the carriers on the screen here, these were announced a week or two ago that they're going to participate in the individual exchange. There's a second exchange called the SHOP, and that'll be for small businesses. And that will be announced June 6th, so just this Thursday they'll announce what carriers are going to be in that. Now, luckily for the exchange, you can see the blue, so the Anthem Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Kaiser, Health Net. Some of the more well-known commercial carriers have already opted into the individual exchange. And certainly there, there's a hope that they also 
participate in the shop to make it uh, some well-known brand name options for employers. Now we're gonna really get into the weeds here and I hope you've had your coffee because we're gonna have to get a little uh, technical, but I want you to, as a, a takeaway, think about how this is gonna impact your course. More importantly, it's gonna impact everyone on how you staff, how you manage hours, how you manage payroll. You're gonna be on top of it, be very proactive, and first things first though, let's see if you're subject to the employer mandate. <laughs> The employer mandate, commonly known as you've heard the pay or play, and you are subject to the employer mandate if you have 50 full-time equivalents. A full-time equivalent is very easy. It's gonna be your number of full-time hires, but just because you have under 50 employees that are full-time, doesn't mean you're not subject to healthcare reform. You have to look at the hours worked by your part-time staff and add that up each month and divide it by 120. So you can see in the example here, you could have a course with 30 full-timers and 23 that work just 25 hours a week. Those 23 that work in 25 hours, when you add up their called the full-time equivalent, you've got a total of 50 employees or 50 full-time equivalents. So in this case, you might have you know, 23 employees working on food and beverage who you have no intent to insure. But because you have 50 full-time equivalents, you are subject to the employer mandate. Now, a lot of companies, and it's very easy to overlook this, is are you a member of a controlled group? So, if you have two separate companies and there's 80% common ownership between the two, each entity is subject to healthcare reform. And again, the employer mandate. So in this scenario, you have two separate clubs, both of them well in the 50. You have Grande Oaks with 20 full timers, and you see the part timers, and then Pro Practice Center, again, each entity well under 50, but because there's a common ownership between the two, each entity is now subject to the employer mandate, again, which means health care reform. So the, the one, if you might call it a luxury, is that although each of them has to comply, they can take different routes to comply with the bill. Each company separately, though, does need to adhere to healthcare reform. Now, the one thought is that, let me take a step back here. Okay, the very last here in the red. We've had clients well before healthcare reform started who might be manufacturing, have 60 on the factory floor, 20 in the office, and they could not afford to offer benefits to the level, to the 60 on the factory floor, to the level they want to offer the 20 in the office. Or if they offered it, many of them just wouldn't sign up for a period. So those companies, they literally break their company into two. So you have two separate companies. Now, they're not trying to get off the hook for complying with healthcare reform, but by doing that, you could offer a very rich plan to your 20 execs, and then the worker bees, the other 60, are also offered a plan. Not as rich, but is a way to get around with the compliance aspect of healthcare reform. Now, going back to fair play, the penalty for not offering insurance is going to be $2,000 per employee. And before I was having breakfast this morning with the gentleman, he asked me, well, outside of insurance offered to the employees, isn't the employee also penalized if they do not take insurance? And it's absolutely correct. In 2014, if you're an individual and you're uninsured, the penalty 
that again, you won't pay until you file your 2014 taxes in April of 15. It's the greater of 1% of household wages or $95. And we had a really good conversation back and forth and he's under 40, very healthy. And he says, well, that penalty is way too small. There's no way I'm gonna buy health insurance if it's only $95. It's a no brainer. There's no way I'm gonna pay 500 bucks a month to insure my family versus paying the penalty. He's absolutely right. And the problem is we have this system that penalizes people for not taking the insurance, but the penalty is so small that it's not going to bring the young, healthy people into the pool, which is exactly who we need. It's pretty predictable that first year, the risk newly insured is going to be terrible. Now, in this example here, uh, again, looking at Grande Oaks and Pro Practice Center, Let's say they've got 60 full-time employees now. As an employer, paying the penalty of $2,000, you're actually off the hook for the first 30 employees. So in this scenario, it's a $60,000 penalty. Not a write-off, not a tax deduction, but certainly $1,000 a year would be a lot less expensive than having to insure 60 employees. Now, the other side of the coin is if you play. So again, pay or play. Pay the penalty or play, offer insurance. So of course, not surprising, there's a few rules here. Uh, first and foremost, it must be affordable. And we will dig into affordable. It must address the 10 essential health benefits. And on the right there, that picture lists the 10 criteria that a policy must Covered, okay, and the benefits must be covered at 60%. This is called the minimum value coverage. So, of those 10 items, they must be covered, and the insurance must pick up 60% of the cost of each of each of each benefit. Now, what's affordable and I need you to take a look at this. You need to think of your own club. Think of the lowest compensated employee that's full time. So the math is full time. And, and, and by the way, I was talking to someone else. Full time for many clubs is 40 hours a week. And even today, you can still have your eligibility for health insurance at 40 hours. Come January 1, an employee working 30 hours, whether you call them full-time or not, they are eligible for health insurance. And I know that's a, a real shift for a lot of people. So going back to the 9.5%, this is the affordable. And again, it gets really uh, technical in the definition, but bottom line, your employee's wages, your lowest compensated employee, nine and a half percent of their monthly wages is the maximum you can charge them for the health insurance. And for a lot of companies, you have different contributions today for management versus those in F and B versus those working out on the ground square. Okay? Come 2014, the rules have not been issued yet, but we expect them this fall. Everyone's going to be paid. Everyone's going to be paying the same for health insurance. So, your administrative staff, your food and beverage, your groundskeepers, your club has to make the same contribution for each of them. We expect that to come out. They've been teasing us for three years now, but certainly it will be effective January one. And in this example, you look at someone uh, working 30 hours a week at $8 an hour. You can see the maximum you can ask that employee to pay for their health insurance is $98.04. So when we go back to the staffing rules, you can see that as an employer, it makes very little sense to staff someone at 30 hours. Because it really stifles your ability 
to pass on the cost for the health insurance. So your employee working 30, you're going to want to bump them to 40 if at all possible. Because also those extra 10 hours of pickup, if you pull away from your part-timers, because you need to also, if you think about this, you might have part-timers working 32 hours a week right now. You call them part-time, have no intention of insuring them, but now that you have to, you need to proactively suppress their hours. The last fold here, a workaround for the employee contribution rules having to be the same for everyone is that if, let's say, the management now has health insurance at no cost, but now they're have to pay, let's say, $100 a month, well, the workaround is you can gross their wages up each month $100. They pre-tax $100 as their contribution. It's a net wash for the employee, but it has allowed you to comply because technically they've paid $100 just like everyone else on the health insurance. Now, what if your coverage is not affordable? And for some businesses, it will be a calculated risk to intentionally offer insurance that's not affordable. Remember, you are compliant by just offering coverage. They don't have to take it. So you can see there is an incentive to offer coverage, and if it's too expensive for them to take it, well, maybe that's not the worst thing. You haven't had to pay for their coverage you're compliant, but you can get smoked out, and when I say smoked out, the only way for the employer to be penalized for not offering affordable coverage is if the employee enrolls on the insurance through the exchange. That will, in a sense, trigger, we'll say, an audit, and they're going to trace back that employee to your company, they're going to identify was the coverage affordable, and if it was not, the penalty is three thousand dollars per employee. So you can see the penalty for offering coverage that's not affordable is actually more expensive than not offering coverage at all. And uh, even worse, a real, a real kick is that the the same gal who was uh, in charge of the, the IRS Tea Party nonsense is now in charge of collecting the money for healthcare reform. So uh, certainly our, our tax dollars have worked there. I'm sure she'll do a great job. Sure. <laughs> now, when do you have to comply? So you have to comply in January 1, and many companies are eligible for what's called transition relief. Transition relief means that you can defer complying with the legislation until your policy year renewal. So if you renew in September, you don't have to comply in January. You can kick the can down the road until September. And that's provided, though, you can jump through multiple hoops. To really simplify it, okay? And again, as I told you, we're going to get into the weeds here. They're going to go back to December 27th of last year. And if you offer coverage, and I'm really simplifying it, to a third of your employees or a quarter of your employees were enrolled in the plan, you get deferred compliance until your policy renewal in 2014. So if you have a September 1 renewal, uh, the good thing is you can kick the can down the road for another eight months, which is really going to be to your benefit. Now, let's talk about who needs to be insured. We talked about now many clubs are going to have employees who work 35 hours. You call them part-time, have zero intent of insuring them. They are not eligible. So anyone working 30 hours, but we also have to insure what are called variable hour employees. Variable hour employees for the purpose of healthcare reform are those employees that their hours are all over the place. Sometimes they're 28, sometimes they're 35, sometimes they're at 25. It's an inconsistent work schedule. You can see that those employees may inadvertently work 30 hours over a defined period. And you have just 
inadvertently opted in to offer them health insurance. So you can see being very, very diligent and proactive. The three time periods, they have a measurement, and administrative and stability. We're going to assume you've got a January 1 renewal. The measurement period, it's a 12-month window in the past. We look at all of your payroll and determine who worked 30 hours. Those folks are eligible for health insurance. The administrative period is a, is a 60-day window where you basically crunch the data from the measurement period. And the stability period is the time where they are off of insurance. Okay. Now, you can see this last one here, the new waiting periods. Come January 1, some of you have 180-day waiting periods for employees and health insurance. It's going to go down to 90 days, effective January 1. But California said, we will not be out of time offering less uh, generous benefits for employees. The California State Legislature said it will be 60 days in California, effective January 1, employees will be, have to be enrolled on the health insurance. So we think, uh, can't blame DC for everything, you can blame Sacramento for that last one. We're going to do an example here on the measurement period. I'm just going to jump to conclusion. Remember, when you look at the hours worked over the measurement period, okay, here's the real kicker. If someone works 30 hours, maybe just because you got sloppy on payroll, didn't manage it sufficiently, that person is offered the insurance for the entire stability period, which is 12 months. But that's regardless of how many hours they work during the stability period. So you could conceivably have someone working 20 hours a week during the stability period, but because they worked over 30, like literally over a year ago, you have to offer insurance for the entire 12 months. And the real takeaway here, the action on this, and just take a step back and really think about the numbers here. If you have to comply in January 1, we're talking about looking at payroll from November of last year until November of this year. Well, we're halfway through that. So if you have employees tracking over 30 hours who you really have, do not or cannot afford to offer coverage, you got about five months to knock your hours down. And the problem is you're heading into you know, a very busy time, but you need to be very aware of the ramifications. Or it's terrible to say, but you have to hire more part-time employees to take some of the steam out of your part-timers who are going to be working over 30 hours. I put one person to sleep, I can tell, so I, I know I have uh, reached my goal, so. Excellent, only one that so says I'm pleased with that. Let's talk about uh, last thing here, alternative plan designs. There's a product on the market, and so you know, if you're an employer, you're thinking about your nut for the health insurance. Okay, you've got your costs here. The penalty is $2,000. Well, the real sweet spot is, is there a plan on the market less expensive than the penalty. That would be a win-win. There's a carrier in the market that has just that product. And if you look at the benefits, you would say, these are terrible. This is a terrible plan. And you're absolutely right. It is terrible. But it's less expensive than paying the penalty. Okay? So let's take a step back. If you offer a base plan, it's inexpensive. And it's not compliant. But remember, to absolve yourself as the employer of paying the penalty, you have to offer them a plan that's compliant and affordable. They don't have to take it. You just have to offer it. You are off the hook of paying the penalties if you offer a plan that both covers the 10 essential health benefits at 60% and is quote unquote affordable. And that's an approach that a lot of employers are going to be looking at with the full disclosure to the employees that this inexpensive plan is nowhere comparable to what you currently have, but 
it is an option. And it's almost like a carrot that you want to dangle out there and have the employee jump on to be insured and compliant. Because if the only plan you offer is the plan you're offering today, which is going to be much more expensive than $2,000 a month, you almost can't afford for all the employees to take that And I, I would be remiss if I wasn't talking about HealthNet's uh, Salute product. It's not available here in the desert, unfortunately, but uh, HealthNet, as I'm sure many of you know, they've gone out to the hospitals, the providers that are more likely to be selected by your Hispanic and Spanish-speaking employees. And it's a very small network, but it's less expensive than Kaiser the majority of the time. And if you haven't looked at it, you just leave the money on the table because it's a very inexpensive product. So really, just kind of wrap this up, you know, the first steps are, do you have 50 full-time equivalents? And what really stinks about this is that you're in the middle of the calculation. The 50 full-time equivalents to see if you have to comply next year, it needs your payroll for all 12 months of 2013. So conceivably, you might not know until the fourth quarter if you have to comply January 1. If you do, do you qualify for the transition relief? Then you gotta find out who needs to be insured. You gotta crunch the numbers using the measurement, administrative and disability periods. And then of course, some clubs, it will make sense to not have for coverage and to pay the penalty. You have to give that serious consideration because the cost to comply is going to be so onerous that a very unpopular decision not offering coverage needs to be looked at and the members need to be crunched. So I want to thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention today. I know it wasn't the most uh, exciting and uplifting message, but we wanted to make you aware of it. Uh, we're going to be partnering with ADP over the next couple of months. Uh, to do these kind of talks. So if you enjoyed this, imagine uh, triple the length and time and uh, we're getting much more detailed about healthcare reform. So again, I appreciate your time and thank you so much for Great, thank you. You've managed to take a dry subject and, and make it quite entertaining and certainly educational. I appreciate that. Um, John McNair, once again, is going to make a couple of introductions and then we're going to move uh, right into Mr. Addison's report. We'll then meet some of our sponsors, have an open forum, and we'll be golfing in no time at all. Thank you. Currently, we have 1,697 members and apprentices, of which 1,313 are members and 384 are apprentices. We are the third largest section, and we have the, large, we have the largest number of apprentices in the country. Um, now I'd like to recognize some deceased members. Terry McCabe, Gordon Kenry, Frank Murray, who incidentally was a past president and golf professional of the year in 1972. Ernie Gossler, who actually uh, was one of the founders of PJ West, where we're sitting today. So. And Ken Venturi, who won the US Open in 1964. We have a moment of silence for Thank you. Since the annual meeting, 40 newly elected members have uh, been elected to our section. Uh, I'd like to uh, have those that are here please stand. We'll hold the applause to the end. Michael Vlock, Nikki Gatch, Ira Haley, Tyler Hefner, Joe Colbert, Tony Lanza, Henry Loa, and Eric Real. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. In addition, we have 50 new newly registered apprentices. If, uh, the ones who stand up that are here, Sammy Moncrief, 
Elias Rulis, Mark Surin, and Andrew Zeller. Congratulations. that 
decrease is attributable to your businesses, unfortunately. When we start looking at the golf businesses themselves and operations, that's where most of the income was lost uh, over the past uh, three years. So I think we all knew that, and that's probably not uh, earth-shattering information to us, but I think when we, when we see this in written form, that, that's, uh, uh, that kind of takes us aback a little bit. But the, on the positive side, uh, golf is still one of the leading producers uh, in the state. Uh, in fact, if you look at one of the pages, uh, golf provides uh, um, uh, more to the golf economy than movie theaters, fitness and recreational sports, uh, nurseries, and amusement theme, park, theme parks, which include, includes uh, Disneyland and the like by, by a significant number. Uh, the other real positive uh, piece of this uh, is in California that uh, we support uh, over 100, we support 128,000 jobs uh, with wage income from the state of 4.1 billion dollars. So that's a significant piece of the California economy right there. The other piece we added to this report was and, and is the uh, environmental piece and, and I call your attention to that uh, many times, especially out here in the Coachella Valley uh, or in the Coachella Valley. Uh, we talk about the water use, whether it be in San Diego, here, uh, wherever it might be. Uh, and there's some comparative figures in here that are really important for all of us to know as operators and, and as managers is what do we really consume uh, through the golf industry in California. As you'll see in, in this report, it's far less than what you might think. In fact, it's, it's quite a, a small percentage compared to other industries uh, in California. So these are the kinds of things that, that need to be pointed out, must be pointed out. We would encourage you to use this report. Uh, it's available on scpga.com. Uh, it's available in a hard copy if you need it, but I recommend you go to scpj.com. Uh, there's a summary version uh, that's easy to print off, and then there's a, a little more uh, substantive version uh, that you, of course, can print off as well. But I would encourage you, and we would encourage you, to distribute this report to your Chamber of Commerce, to your, your legislator, to your community leaders uh, in your area, and help uh, educate and familiarize uh, your leaders with what golf really means to uh, to their specific area. Uh, right now, this, this report is solely dealing with California. We have, as a group, looked at the potential and the possibility of doing regionalized reports. Uh, they're not inexpensive to do. This report was $60,000 to do, and through the contributions of those organizations I mentioned earlier, we were able to do this report. Uh, to do the Coachella Valley, for example, in one report on its own is $30,000. So. What we're looking at, though, in the next renewal and uh, the next update of this plan is to expand into different regions in California uh, and offer more for us to, uh, to look at in that regard. Uh, so I would encourage you to take a look, study. If you have any questions, please call me. Uh, I'll volunteer Craig Kessler at the Southern California Golf Association. Don't hesitate to call us, uh, President Johnson, uh, at, at any time, and, uh, and hopefully we can help uh, and if, if you want anyone to speak on these types of reports uh, to your club or your community, uh, please let us know. So uh, thank you for that, and, and thank you very, very much. One more thing before I introduce David. Uh, and it was mentioned earlier with, with Nikki and Jeff, uh, in Pace of Play, in your section, uh, along with uh, the Southern California Golf Association, the Golf Course Superintendents Association, the Club Managers Association, uh, the operators in golf, uh, we are going to start a campaign uh, looking at how we can do better uh, within golf operations, working with the player uh, in regards to producing a little faster round of golf uh, by saving short periods of time on each hole based on, uh, might be tee placement, might be hole placement, uh, it might be rough cut instead of an inch and a quarter, it might be three quarters of an inches uh, to help people find their golf ball. We're going to do an interview on June 11th uh, that will be published uh, and on video uh, through the various media that will be a roundtable discussion with President Johnson and presidents uh, of the, the respective Golf Course Superintendents Association chapters uh, and the Club Managers Association uh, in California and, and talk about pace of play and what we can do together. And uh, so you'll see more on that and you'll see more uh, activity and more opportunity uh, for you to be involved as well. So. Uh, keep your eye out for that, and, uh, and we
we hope that will be a nice campaign, one that, that everybody can join together and, and really impact uh, the, the pace of play and the speed of play. Um, with that, I would now like to introduce uh, uh, our foundation director and business development uh, director uh, to talk with our sponsors, uh, David Merle. David. Thanks, Tom, and welcome again, everybody, uh, to this year's summer meeting, uh, Easy Go Summer Meeting and Pro Pro Scramble. Uh, first up, um, we're lucky to have a, a lady from the PGA Expo, so we're going to call up Liz Reed uh, to have a short presentation on, on this year's event. So, Liz Reed, come on up. Thank you, Tom. The dates are August the 19th through the 21st um, in Las Vegas at the Venetian. Um, there's a pre-registration form at the front desk if anyone would care to sign up today. You just need your name and your PGA number and we're getting you in the system. Um, the lineup, as you can see, you can get 20 MSR credits by attending the show. Uh, there's a new structure around education. Uh, we're happy to have a couple of certification programs that we've never had before. Uh, one of them is a kickstart to the PGA C, uh, PP 2.0 player development. I know that's normally a five to eight month program, but they, uh, they've had requests some, for some face-to-face -face, uh, starts to the program, so this is a five hour session that will get that going. We're also happy to uh, be working with FlightScope. FlightScope have an academy where they have a whole day uh, opportunity to become certified in their equipment. Uh, we're also offering that at the show as well. Uh, the certification programs will happen the day prior to the show opening. So that's on Monday, August the 19th. Uh, that will then be followed by an instructional workshop that happens out at demo day with Mike Maleska followed by demo night itself. So we're trying to pack in a little bit more before the show opens. Um, okay. uh, the next schedule should be a schedule of events um, that's happening at the show. But the real focal point, I think, for everyone here is probably education. Uh, you should have received a handout at your, your tables when you came in today. And the back of that actually shows you what we have in store in terms of education. So that kind of outlines it for you. Uh, the major difference being the certification programs on Monday, and then on Tuesday it's actually going to be a mandatory day of education, so you won't actually have choices in what you go through. There's going to be a three-hour fast track to leadership development uh, that's hosted by uh, the PGA of America, and it's a three-hour panel discussion. Uh, and then in the afternoon there's going to be a, a new thing which is called the uh, tech. Uh, symposium on technology and uh, we're happy to have uh, Mike Johnson, the uh, uh, equipment writer for Golf Digest, that's going to be moderating that for us. And then on Wednesday we will return to the format that you're probably used to, which is choices around player development instruction, uh, retail. Um, and then um, we're having something new on the show floor, which is kind of appeared to be a mind share where everyone that's taken part in education can sit in round, uh, round tables and they'll be facilitated according to the property type is all public or private. Um, that's it for education. And then the other thing we just wanted to let everyone be uh, aware of is that the show in Orlando actually next year is going to be having new dates. Uh, we're going to a Tuesday, Friday format. We did a lot of focus groups around the country and has spoken to an awful lot of people before we made this change. Uh, this allows uh, folks to get home for the weekend, so uh, that should be new for us. So that means demo day will now be happening on Tuesday, and then the actual show dates will be Wednesday through Friday. 
And then the last page should just be my contact information if I can help you in any way, shape or form. With any questions around the show, I'd be happy to. Thanks very much for having me and I hope to see you in Vegas. Royal Melbourne, Kingston Heath, 
uh, Sanctuary Cove, which is out of Scottsdale, of course. And if there's nothing else to remember about today, uh, Australia has about 23 million people. It has, you know, aside from the wildlife, the kangaroos, the koala, etc., that you all know about, uh, it has, as a sporting nation, the most, you know, most Olympic gold medals, the most uh, world awards per, per head of the population. It's a really sporting country. But I think it's your duty as Americans to bring you off and teach them the meaning of the word respect. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> But please talk to us at the end of the, 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 the thing. Uh, take, take your, you'll have a great time in Australia. Uh, it's great wine, good, great beer, uh, and a fantastic experience. And we look forward to uh, helping you with your trip. Yeah, talk to us. Thank you very much. Next up, we're going to call from Lightscope. We have Will Millet. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, our partnership with the Summit County PGA 
Um, today for the tournament, we're going to have everybody's going to have a golf button or a new golf button voice in the cart um, to be able to use and see how it's a very, very popular product. And I also wanted to let everybody know that Doug Campbell is our new LA Orange County rep. Um, Doug's going to say a few words. And thanks for your guys' support.
But I, I have a favor to ask of you, and that favor is that even if you don't concern yourself with sun protection and uh, sun protection education, it's really important for you to model good sun protection for your students, and especially junior golfers. The sun exposure we get as kids is what often causes problems as an adult, and a single blistering sunburn can double your risk of developing skin cancer. So please develop good technique, model that for your students, provide your students with the education, and um, I was really encouraged. We brought sunscreen for you for your tournament today, but I noticed that there's also sunscreen in the uh, in the restrooms. My one word of advice: hydrate, hydrate, hydrate today when you're playing out in the tournament. Thank you very much, and thank you to the SNPGA. We had a couple other sponsors for this event that weren't able to be here. Uh, we had U.S. Foods. Uh, we had a Global Tour Golf that was um, up front during registration, uh, Snack Golf, also Atlas Van Lines, Joshua was up there, he had to leave, and also Pepsi, uh, Dustin Burke was there. Uh, and definitely hydrate today, Pepsi is providing water and Gatorade uh, for everybody at the event. Um, we had 12 fantastic sponsors, this is the largest uh, sponsored group that we've ever had. Uh, they support you. Definitely try to support them. Reach back out to them if they're emailing you, calling you. Follow-up uh, phone call is fantastic. Uh, on the back of your agenda, we have a contact list of all the sponsors today. Uh, also on our website, and we will be shooting out uh, an email shortly with all of our sponsors. We have 60 uh, current sponsors with the Southern California PGA. Uh, so they're very, very supportive. Uh, and they help us do uh, everything uh, here at the section. So uh, enjoy the day, uh, have fun out there, and uh, definitely stay hydrated. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks to all the men and women and their enduring and sustaining support for these activities that we enjoy. Uh, uh, not the least of which is your golf tournament today where your purse will exceed $16,000. So one more round of applause. <laughs> we have no old business and no new business. I'd like to move right to open forum. We've got a floor mic, and with that, I'll open the floor to comments and questions. Yes, all the way in the back. That's new business. New business. We'll go back to new business. Anytime you like, seven days a week. Uh, 
uh, and it's still should always be getting the room to start usually in June, I think, is when it started in the past. So that's open again. Anybody would like to join. A lot of like guys are together to come out and bring their uh, members up there. So anyway, if that's available, we'll see again that's going out to mail here in the next week or so. That's wonderful. It's a great program, and it's certainly a benefit to PGA members here at the section. Comments? Is that Mr. Drummond? I, I'm sorry, I can't. Please, Mr. Gunn.
And I know there's a lot of different opinions on it. If anyone else has a question on angering, I'd be more than happy to address it. It's hard to speak for everyone, but I think what Ted did is he tried to take a stance based on what we felt the majority of our members felt, and also the board of directors. So it wasn't something that Ted was out there just speaking for Ted or speaking for the officers. That was never the intent. Respectfully, it's very difficult to speak for everyone, but we try to represent the masses, and that's what I think Ted was trying to do. Thank you. Paul, is it safe to say that um, the PGA of America, the PGA Tour, and the Canadian PGA would be the three entities that currently um, are cited, and everyone else is perhaps vacant? Well, well, first of all, um, you know, it's interesting because the Royal Nation basically governs the rules of golf for the whole world, uh, other than the USGA's rules really govern, you know, Mexico, kind of not even the Western Hemisphere, the upper the North America part of the world. So six of the seven continents are governed by the RA. And I think right now, you know, the Canadian PGA has been very much aligned. Um, Greg Schubert, their president, we've had contact with, they've been supportive, we've had letters back and forth. Obviously the PGA Tour would have been aligned, but at this point in time, as I shared earlier, we're just going to kind of have a wait and see. We've, we've made our stance. There's been a lot of communication, there's been a lot of information in the press, and you know, the PGA Tour, there are nine players, I'm sure many of you have read and seen. Bernard Langer being one of the more infamous of the nine. A lot of really good players on today's tour. They have hired an attorney. They have not filed a lawsuit. They're investigating their options because there's a chance the tour doesn't do anything. And the tour just sits back and says, you players want to do something, you can. We support you doing something, but the tour's not going to do anything. Then again, the tour might come out tomorrow and say, we're going to bifurcate the rules and create our own rules or write you know, be taken right our own rules of golf, kind of control our destiny there. I will share that a couple good things that came out of it, we've probably had as much candid talks with the USGA that have been had in quite some time. We have agreed to go back, and from what I understand, Pat, maybe you can tell me, but maybe there was a point in time where each year the USGA and the, our leadership met. We've agreed that we need to start doing that again and have a meeting. One thing that the tour and the PGA of America tried to do, and Tim and Ted, and uh, let's see, Tim, Ted, Derek, Glenn Nager, and Tom O'Toole, who's the vice president of the USGA, they met at the Players' Championship, and they've tried to ask to have a seat at the table for future rulings, to include us, but I think at this point in time, the USGA is not in a position to do that, although they said that as other controversial subjects come up, they would obviously ask for comment. So we have tried to be a voice, we try to be part of the process. The USGA writes the rules of golf. Do we, the PGA, want to be in charge of the rules of golf? Do we want to take that over? I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no. A lot of people don't think so. Does the tour want to do that? It's a tough subject. Any other comments on anger and stroke? Has been around for a long time. Yes. Yes. Tom Wilson. It's not anchoring, it's uh, education. And I want to uh, just uh, inform people that we have a, a what should be a really good education uh, seminar coming up on July 9th in the afternoon. It's going to be at the Ashford Lab. And John Ashworth is going to be there, and we're going to have some other professionals there. We're going to talk about their success in merchandising. So it should be an excellent one. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, we're just finishing up year two of a four-year uh, period of where you need to basically earn a total of 54 MSR points and 36 participation points. And in our section, we only have 138 uh, members that have reach those goals at this time, and we have 977. So uh, you're going to have a lot of opportunities to uh, take advantage of attending meetings, participating, and uh, uh, education things. Uh, this 
these seminars in Las Vegas is a great place to do it. Go there, have fun, and get the, up to 20 hours, basically, or MSR points at that time. So anyway, we're going to have a fun one. You'll see uh, the uh, an entry form for the uh, uh, Ashworth deal coming out here soon. We do have a, an awful lot of educational opportunity, and Tom uh, Wilson uh, is serving as our education chair. And as all of you know, all education is free of charge, so please take advantage of it. Since we're uh, on the education thing, most of you uh, from the Desert Chapter know I'm Mike Amira from the TaylorMade Lab. Uh, just to jump on the education again, it's, uh, we're going to have on July 15th a social media for golfers, kind of like a dummies thing. And uh, that'll be held down here. Uh, we'll get some information out to you, but uh, confirmed the date earlier this week. So uh, look for a social media thing, Facebook, Twitter, all the things that as golf professionals, teachers, uh, fitters like myself, or anybody in the golf business, how that can uh, be advantageous and club drives around. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's very nice. And, you know, we have 27 committees in your section, all doing a variety of things. Uh, and, and one of those committees uh, is your tournament committee. They're incredibly active and very conscientious to your wishes. And when I uh, made the offhanded comment about shorts earlier, uh, you know, it was many years ago we decided from May 30th until September 30th that you could wear shorts, but not in championship events. And I know that uh, some of you take exception to that rule. And if the host professional of the club doesn't require trousers, uh, I know Rob, I would be happy to take that back to the tournament committee for consideration. So, yes, please, Mr. Riley. You may not like what I'm going to say, but to the USDA, golf professionals are still cats. You understand that? We were not involved in this rule at all in relationship to anchoring the public. The USDA has no data to support their findings other than the fact they haven't interpreted that it's not a stroke. And that's in their purview. In 1987, P.J. Brookwright and David Fay in the USDA met on this issue. And it was the decision at that time that this is a stroke. They said, you're hitting the ball with the club. How you hold on to it, other than the side saddle, or other than between your legs, it's a stroke. It's not a push, it's not a shot. That's history. That was verified by David Fay at this year's Masters in a conversation with a couple of past presidents. So, where are we? The next group for the USGA is the ball. The ball. Now the ball affects 1% of the people on tour. You play a golf course in my age, 78, and you get back to about 7,000 yards, you were your fairway with that. If they take 10% off the ball of what you're talking about, the golf course that we have today to your membership and who you represent will be obsolete. They won't be able to play. The modern player, because of science, equipment, conditioning, will make very little difference. You take 10% off the 360 yard drive, that's nothing. And they're, they're driving the ball that far on the run. So this is just the opening solve for the USGA in the RNA. The sad part of this, and this is coming from me, this is not the PGA of America's position, is this is one man. This is one guy, Peter Blossom, the secretary of the RNA. When Ernie Ellis made the putt on the 18th hole to win this year's, last year's British Open, he said he won't be using that putt in the future because he anchored the putt. Billy Casper anchored the putt on his knee. 
Two writers won two tournaments in the early 60s, actually the putter in his chest, because that was the preferred method that Paul Brennan taught at that time. Put your hands like this, you shove it up in your chest. It had nothing to do with nerves. I played a lot of golf with third writers. He could do anything with a golf along with three, along with three to win. I put it in the PGA Championship at Columbine with the long putter. I put with the long putter today. If the USGA and the RNA change the rules, I'll figure out a way to putt in accordance with the rules. We're in the box. All of us. If the PGA of America and the PGA Tour decide that they're going to write their own rules, and we are, I was a broad professional hands up. I work for my employer. They make the rules, and they have third detail. If I'm strong enough to convince my membership to use the long putter, they're not going to play in third detail, because I can guarantee you the Southern California Golf Association will adopt the rules of the USGA and the RNA as they should. Professional golf should not be in a position to make the rules. That's what makes our game special. That's what makes us special. But at the same time, we as the implementers of the rules, when they come off the golf course and somebody moved the ball or somebody did something, did it out of bounds and did the wrong thing, too many clubs. They're not calling the RNA, the US, the USGA, they're talking to us. We're the guys that enforce the rules. So we should be involved in making it. But gentlemen, this is the first solve in a long battle. And it's going to be the ball. It's going to be the ball next. It's going to take some time. I was involved in the square group issue back in the late 80s. And the square groove issue was a big deal at that time. But it was because of the tougher guys. It was because of Mark Tucker and Freddie Collins. They had a lot of play. And they were playing pins, remember? And they could spin the ball with that spring. And then we had guys that Lee Trevino, we had guys that Payne Stewart, we had guys that Dan Rogers, they could spin it with a shovel. They were that good. So we had this argument about the effect of the groups. But who did it affect? Now we're playing with a solid ball. It affected the people that we're trying to get to play golf. The people that we're trying to teach them how to spin the ball, teach them how to hit it a few yards further. When I walked into that room, I'm an ex cat and I'm proud of it. You understand that? I'm proud of it. And when I walked into that room for the first time at the USGA, I realized who I was doing with. Just from the time I was 10 years old, I was working for him. I worked for him for 30 years at Amazon. We are caddies. We'd gone to college. We may have been, we, we may have been our students. But the USGA and the RMA, they still don't respect us. They don't respect us for what we are. We're a professional. We grow the game. We put our, we put our, our deaths, our sweat, and our tears on the line to take a kid that's in trouble. We take a kid that's trying to play. We take an adult that wants to play a little better. We're getting women to play golf. We're the ones that do it. Or we're the ones that you're going to continue to do it, one person at a time. But don't fool yourself. I don't care what the PGA Tour does. I don't care what the European Tour does. I do care what the PGA of America does. And I was for, and so they've implemented it, I was for the, the period where we could talk about it. There was no period. That was a joke. They had their mind made up before they even announced it. And they had their mind made up by the ball the same way. So be prepared. You represent the game of golf. You are the game of golf. But don't forget, you work for amateurs. And amateurs are the bloodline of our great game. That supports the USGA and the RNA for what they're doing. And 
as I said to Ted Bishop, I said, hey man, turn the next page. Yesterday is history. Today is the present. Tomorrow is the mystery. Do it with the present. God bless you guys.